Amen. <clears throat> so we are, um, we've been going through the book, we've been going through the book of Joshua, and we've been talking about being courageous, courageous, courage for everyday people, for us to be courageous in our lives as we go on. Now, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed, as we read the Old Testament, and uh, sometimes as Christians we like to stick to the New Testament, but we need to really read to the Old Testament because it is a shadow of the New. But there is a lot of um, things within the Old Testament that are symbolic to what God was going to do eventually. There are pictures of something greater that, they, that God would eventually do. And we see this in the sacrifices that the Israelites would do, right? And where did it lead? It led us to see the sacrifice that Jesus would pay for our sins. We see it with Jonah being swallowed by a whale, by a large fish, and then being in there for three days. And it, it reminds Reminds us of Christ being buried, killed, and buried for three days, and then he came back to life. We see it in the Passover and then even in the final plague where all the firstborns were killed and the blood was put on the door frames. And it reminds us again of Christ because the blood of Jesus is on us. It passes over the spirit of death and we live with God. We see it also in Abraham. Sacrifice, willing to sacrifice his own son because God had commanded a, 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 an act of faith. But yet, eventually, God would sacrifice his own son for us. They always lead to us seeing Jesus, all of these uh, symbols, all of these illustrations, all of these pictures that we see in the Old Testament. <clears throat> now, last week, we spoke about circumcision, right, and how it speaks of a greater Thing, how it speaks of something that God would eventually do. And circumcision is a big deal in the Jewish faith. All the boys are circumcised at eight days old. And it's something that they all go through and must go through. Because God had made a covenant with the people of Israel. He had made a covenant, and this, the circumcision was there to remind them forever of this covenant. It was a promise, a seal that you can never forget of what God had done. Now on this side of the cross, circumcision has not ended. But God still requires a circumcision from us, but a different circumcision, a more important one, as Pastor Wayne showed us last week. And he read from uh, Romans chapter 2, and verses 28 and 29, and we'll read it again today. A person is not a Jew who is one uh, only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart. By the spirit, not by the spirit, not by the written code. Such person's praise is not from other, from other people, but from God. God is not looking for us to be physically circumcised. And all the men said, Amen. Rather, it's circumcision of the heart. And the church embraced this very early in its history. I don't know if you remember reading in the book of Acts, chapter 15, in the Council of Jerusalem, and they were actually discussing this very thing. God has shown Peter that the Gentiles, us, would come to faith, but Gentiles were not circumcised. They did not have the physical circumcision. And there were some that were pushy and said they must be circumcised. And what does Peter say? No. Why would you put us as leaders of a church in such bondage, he actually says. No, this cannot happen. Peter says no. They understood the physical circumcision would not save you. But there was something greater that they needed. They needed the circumcision of the heart. And it is at this moment of the when our hearts are being circumcised, this is really when we become what? Born again. We become Christians. This is when God makes us a new creation. This is when God separates us from death and gives us life. This is when the devil is no longer our father, but now Christ has adopted us. We are now part of the family of God. This is when the great exchange happens, that we give God our unrighteousness, and He gives us His righteousness. We are no longer saved. Uh, uh, we're no longer slaves of sin, but now we are slaves of 
righteousness because of this. This is when all, everything that the Holy Spirit seals us within our own selves and the salvation is secure. This is when the sting of death is gone. No longer have fear of death. This is when we begin our journey into sanctification. That we start to change. The process in our life begins to change. We become better and better, if I can say it that way. More and more into the image of our Savior, Jesus. And we don't stop sinning. I'm going to be honest with you. We don't. But you begin to have this uncomfortable feeling. As a believer, a true believer, and you learn and you read in his word and you read the things that he does not like and you sometimes do those things, you start to have this uncomfortable feeling inside of you because you don't want to sin anymore because the Spirit of God is inside of you and it's, it's convicting you of the sin. Now, we're not here to talk about circumcision. If you want to know more about that subject, you need to go to last week's uh, service, learn to see what... God did in Joshua chapter 5. And Joshua chapter 5 shows us, it speaks to us about the people of Israel needing to be circumcised. And this is very symbolic to what God does in our own hearts. That He's circumcising our hearts. He is saving us, setting us free. Now we're going to live our life for the Lord. And this isn't going to be easy. The next journey that we take, just as Israel is about to, to do something great, they're about to walk into the promised land. They're about to do the thing that God had commanded them to grab it. It's still not going to be easy. There's going to be wars. There's going to be things that they're going to have to do that are going to be challenging. They don't just walk in and start building their homes. But they chose to walk in there, to do the thing that God wanted them to do. It's not easy. But it continues. So, circumcision is very symbolic to what God would do in our hearts. But now we're going to look at Joshua chapter 6, uh, 2, 8. And it gives us a glimpse of what God is requiring both of Israel, of Joshua, of Israel. And also it gives us a glimpse of what God requires of us. Of what God is asking for each and every single one of us. Because God has this purpose, and His purposes have not changed, but that his, his people would live and do what He asks. And God gives them, they're, going to, they're about to take over the first city, the city of Jericho. And God gives them very specific instruction. And He expects that they will be listened to, they will do exactly what he says. And we start in Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. And it says, says this, Now the gates of Jericho were securely bared because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men, do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Now, I am not, never been, never studied and never looked at it. I am not an army person. I do not know anything about the military. But I don't think this is very sound military <laughs> advice. This is not what I would tell an individual if they're going to war. I mean, this makes really no sense whatsoever to me in fighting a war. But God begins by saying the gates of Jericho were securely bared because of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. Imagine for a moment being Israel, looking at the city, looking at this massive city with these huge walls and you are going to conquer it. A very secure city. This is going to be hard. Man, Lord, what are we doing? I thought everything was just going to be easy. Just pick some fruits off the tree and keep going. But the Lord says to Joshua, see, I have, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king 
and it's fighting men. Uh, Lord, are we looking at the same thing? Because it doesn't seem, maybe I need glasses here, but I'm not seeing the same thing. God is delivering the city to them. This is going to be work. But God, all he tells them is go for a walk. That's what he tells them. God is looking for obedience. He has placed this nation in a place where they, all they can do is obey. They cannot conquer the city on their own. They're not going to. Jericho was a powerful city. He's looking for obedience. Obe obeying his direction. The things that he says. This is where success will be. 1 Samuel 15 and 22 says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifices, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. I want you to understand this. He just gave them, years back, he gave them all of the sacrifices that they're supposed to do, and the sacrifices really are for the forgiveness of their sins. So it brings them back to the Father. But he is saying, I would rather you obey than to sacrifice. And why is he saying that? See, sacrifices are made because you've not obeyed. Because you have sinned against God. The reason Jesus died for our sins is because we have not been obedient. We have sinned against God. We've sinned. So he says, obey me. Do what I want so you don't have to do the sacrifices, but no. Now, have you ever noticed that whenever you read the Bible, there are sometimes certain portions that are difficult to swallow. There are certain portions of Scripture that your first reaction is not that. It is usually the opposite. Turn the other cheek when somebody slaps you. How many of you would not turn the other cheek? Probably a lot of you. I don't want to admit it. When somebody steals your shirt, you take your jacket off and give them that? Remember, your jacket's got your wallet. When you have an enemy, what is our natural tendency? It's to hate back. But God says to what? Love your enemy. Something inside of you says, no, I don't want to do what God commands. But there's something else inside of you that screams for us to do what God commands, and that is the Spirit of the Lord. Now, let's see what Joshua does. He actually obeys. He listens. And Joshua chapter 6, 15 to 20 says this. On the seventh day... They go up at daybreak and march around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circle the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet's blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to to the Lord. This is important that we hear this, okay? That everything in it is devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in the house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. Okay, now listen to verses 18 and 19. These are very vital for us to hear. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to the destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into the treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and all the sounds of the trumpets, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone uh, charged straight in and they took the city. Do you know what we see here? We see that they were obedient to the Lord. Day by day, they continued to listen to God's word, to hear the command that God had said for them to do. 
For six days, they kept walking around the city one time, not seeing anything at all. I wonder if some of them questioned their own thoughts. That, Is there anything ever going to happen? Is there something going to happen on the seventh day? But they continued faithfully. They did exactly what the Lord wanted. And on the seventh day, what do we see? We see God's faithfulness. The walls of Jericho come down. They're victorious. They take the city. But there's something else that we saw in those verses I told us to focus on. After the city is taken, the people were not completely faithful. One person in particular was not completely faithful. Joshua chapter 6, 19 says, All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into the treasury. Sometimes I, you know, a long time ago I wondered, you know, why is it that this city, everything belonged to the Lord? Why in this one, the first one? And you know why? Because the first belongs to the Lord. The first belongs completely to the Lord. That's why the Lord commands us to bring our first fruits, to give our best. He doesn't want your second He wants your best. He now belongs to the Lord. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1 says, But the people of Israel broke faith in regards to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmel, the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Just a few things. It actually wasn't a lot. He didn't take a lot compared to what was there. But Achan was disobedient. He sinned against the Lord. He sinned. He did exactly what the Lord had said for him not to do. Now, before Joshua even knows anything that's going on, he knows nothing. He takes his eyes. He's taking Jericho. Now they're going after the next city, the city of Ai, and they're going to conquer this place. And, and he, they, they send a few spies, and it's really easy. This one's easy. Compared to Jericho, this was completely easy. And, the, and his people, his advisors say, you know what? We don't need to waste the whole army. They can relax. Okay? They, they can watch a little bit of TV. Watch some camels walking around. No, here's what we're going to do. We're going to send two to 3,000 soldiers. So Joshua does that. He sends 3,000 soldiers. But the people of Ai defeat them. They run off like, like scared cowards, the Jews. And they kill 36 of their people. 36 people are killed. They come back to Joshua. Joshua feels defeated. He does. He starts to and you can hear it. he starts to complain in his prayer. He is, uh, Lord, why have you done this? A prayer that we would pray. Lord, why, are we, why, why, Lord, tell me why? And God responds to Joshua's complaint by saying this. And we see this in Joshua 7, 10 to 15. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them amongst their own belongings. They have turned their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people, and say, consecrate yourself for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel. There are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before the enemy until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by a lot shall uh, come near by, the, by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes uh, shall now come near the household. See, the Lord is figuring out where this thing is. Eh? The Lord is showing them exactly where, where this stuff is. And the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be what? Burned with fire. He and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And, bec and because he has done a an outrageous thing in Israel...
The Lord is dealing with the sin. God is dealing with this thing. This man, Achan, has stolen from God. He has broken the command that God had given them. The thing that they were supposed to do. Such a simple thing. The first belongs to the Lord. And he has stolen. He lied. Do you know what the lesson is here? Sin should not be taken lightly. Sin should not be taken lightly. So often we think, "Eh, no big deal. It's just a sin. No one will know. But the Lord knows. See, the sin will cost you your lives. It will cost you everything. And not only does it cost you, it costs the people who are closest to you. Thirty-six men were killed because of this man's unfaithfulness. Imagine that. Thirty-six families suffering now in pain because of this man's sin, his greed, his desire to satisfy his own self. This wasn't God's doing. It was Achan's doing. He sinned against God. Sin is the greatest enemy we will ever face. The problem is that we don't think sometimes sin is a big deal. No big deal at all. I mean, all we're doing is something just for ourselves. But God is asking us to do exactly what he wants and to not take it lightly. Don't take it lightly when you do something that God does not want. Actually, he is very aggressive. In the same way we see in the Old Testament, we see in the New Testament. And we see it both in the Sermon on the Mount, but we all see it in Matthew chapter 18, verses 7 to 9. And I'm going to read it for you. And this is how God wants us to deal with sin. It says, Woe to the world for temptation to sin. For it is necessary that a temptation come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand, listen, this is for us. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to get your life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eyes sin, take it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Sin should never be taken lightly. We need to cut it off instantly, as quickly as we possibly can, before it digs its roots in even deeper. Matthew is not advocating here that we start cutting off body parts. Okay, He's not. He's not telling you to pluck your eyeballs out. You know what he's saying? This is just showing how serious the issue is. How quickly and aggressive we should be with the sins in our own lives. This is a graphic image to show us of the seriousness of sin. It is better to lose something in your life than to actually continue in the sin. Maybe it's your computer. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a job. A career. Nothing is worth sinning before a holy God. Yes, we may have to change careers. Yes, you may have to do something different in the way you do the things that you do. But it is because God commands us. He gives us his direction in his word. Joshua dealt with the sin in the people's lives. He dealt with the sin that his nation had committed. And after he took care of it, they took the city of Ai. They took that city. Joshua chapter 8 verse 1 says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed take all the fighting men with you and arise go up to I see I have given into your hands the king of I and his people his city and his land 
Do not fear, rather fight. Do not fear. do what the Lord commands. And the wins the battles for us, but we must listen to the way we are called to fight. We must listen to the way that God wants us to live. This is what it means to have courage for everyday people. To go out there in the world and to live by his word, by the things that God commands us to live by in the midst of a world that may hate us, that may not want us, that may think that the things that we do are foolishness. The Bible says it is foolish to a sinful person. We are called to live by it. To sin or not to sin. That is a question that we must answer each and every single day. We must fight against the temptation to sin. We must fight against the temptation to gossip. We must fight against the temptation of pride, of gluttony, of jealousy. We must fight against those things. We must never steal, never lie, never do the things that God so much doesn't want us to do. We must do whatever it takes. Maybe some of us need to confess sins one to another. We need to tell people of the wrong that we have done, as sensitive as it may be at times and how scary as it may be. When somebody maybe approaches us, what's the first thing? And we, they tell us about something we've done wrong. And we've all had somebody approach us and tell, what do we do? I mean, we, it's like we put our fists up, right? We come defensive. No, 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 I don't like it. We don't even look at what's being said to us. We don't even listen. We, we become like, like, like children. I didn't do that. No, no, that wasn't me. No, I didn't. No, no, that's not true at all. Not only did we sin, now we're lying about the sin. You know, the, one of the roles of the elders board here at our church, of really of any church, should be church discipline. It means if they see something in our life, including myself, they see something in our life, they have a conversation. It might be one-to-one, -one, but eventually it goes where they, maybe they're brought before the elders board and they're corrected. You know, say, hey, listen, you know what you're doing here is not right. It's a sin. You need to stop. But what do the average person, what, does it, what do they do when they're confronted with this sin? Okay, let's say the elders board approaches you. What do you do? You run to another church. That's what we do. We don't deal with the issue. We don't even look at, maybe they're right. Maybe there's something wrong there. Maybe there's something I need to fix. Maybe this is God speaking through an elders board. They don't take it lightly. They search the scriptures. They're very careful about doing things like that. But yet, somebody approaches us and we run off where no one else knows us, right? But God is saying, no, fix the issue. Deal with the sin. Deal with the thing that is so gripping your hearts, even things like unforgiveness. I'm almost done here. This, this story of Joshua, this parallel that we're seeing, we've been circumcised. Our hearts have been circumcised. Now, just like Israel, we're on our journey. And there will be times where we will be disobedient. And all God's going to do is take his hands off and say, you want to be disobedient? Then you will have the consequences of your own. And that is called the wrath of God. And it's God trying to bring correction. And I'm encouraging us all, each and every single one of us. And I'm telling you, I take this very, I, I'm, I'm taking this lightly because... I know that even myself, I am a sinner, but I want to be closer to the Father. I want all, each and every single one of us, to serve the greatest God that we can ever serve. There's the only true God who loved us and gave himself for us, who served us by giving of his life. All he's asking is be obedient. So some of you need to start picking this thing up every single day. Read it. And when you read something that it speaks to you that you're not doing, you do it. Whatever it is, we tell the young people, get an accountability partner. Get somebody that connects with you that will ask you the tough questions. And it will say, are you doing that thing? Are you still lying? Husbands, 
Love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's what it says to us. Are you loving your wife as Christ loved the church? Daily sacrificing himself, yourselves for them? Wives. All this about submitting to our husbands. Are we doing that? Children. Are you honoring your moms and dads? Even when you disagree with them. Doesn't you don't have to agree with them, but you're still being respectful. Church, are we serving, doing everything possible? Are we sharing the gospel? The lack of all those things means we're not living life as we should. So here's what I want to say. We're going to close off here. Joshua dealt with the sin, and he took the next city and continued from there are we dealing with the sin of our lives so we can conquer our own Jericho our own eye and on from there this is true sanctification let us pray <clears throat> father I thank you father we praise you we glorify you we give you everything Lord Father, you are our God, our King, our Savior. Father, help us. Help us to live the life that you've called us to live. Help each and every single person here. Father, all of us, that we, Father, if we're struggling in a certain area, Father, may we be convicted. Father, may we feel bad for the sins that we commit against you. May we bring change, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to change those things that are so difficult. Father, there are areas in our lives that we need to remove things. Father, speak to our hearts. Guide us. Father, send people that will help us. Father, help us to live as you would want us to live according to your every word in your scripture. Father, may we live surrendered life fully to you, Lord. you are a good God you are a wonderful God we are not deserving of your your love but you give it to us anyways Father help our lives be an act of worship to you so that when the world sees us if they like it or not Lord they will see an image of who you are in Jesus name Let's stand, church, and let's worship. <clears throat>